Jaitwani sir is a MD, PG Diploma in Diabetes, a fellow of RSSDI, fellow Diabetes India. Um, he's the executive, chair, uh, executive member for RSSDI, chairman, chairman elect, the Gujarat State Chapter RSSDI, organizing secretary for RSSDI at Ahmedabad. He's the past tutor for PG Diploma in Diabetes Corps from Leicester. He's the section editor for Sadiqot's International Textbook of Diabetes. He's the past president of Association of Physician of Rajkot. He's a consultant diabetologist at Jaitwani Hospital Rajkot and is an academician with more than 10 publications and has presented numerous posters and research uh, at national and international conferences. So over to you, Jaitwani, sir. Thank you, Dhruvi. Our uh, next chairperson is uh, Dr. Raka Shiohare, sir. Uh, he is a diabetologist as well as a poet, a writer, and a multicultural person. He's a director of Lifeline Madhumi Diabetes Hospital from Raipur. He's the chairman for Madhumi Diabetes Welfare Society and Madhupraya's Diabetes Conference. He's the president and founder of the Chhattisgarh State Chapter of Indian Podiatry Association. Uh, he's been affiliated to a lot of associations, be it the IMA, API, RSSDI, DIPC, IAS, ADA, and a consultant for non-invasive cardiology as well. He's a past joint secretary for Chhattisgarh State RSSDI and a lot of accolades to his name, a lot of papers in international and national conferences. With that, I would like to give off the digital platform to Dr. Raka Shiohare and Dr. Pratap Tethani, sir. Thank you, Dhruvi, for kind introduction, and I welcome my co-chair, Dr. Raka, also for this novel, first ever uh, technology world congress from our country. I thank organizers, Dr. Bansi, Dr. Manoj, Dr. Jyoti, Dr. Amit, and Dr. Rakesh Parikh uh, for inviting us to be part of this novel initiative so that we can understand better the use of technology in diabetes. So we all know that type 1 diabetes is a disease, chronic autoimmune disease, which requires lifelong insulin therapy. And if we can prevent it, that will be the best thing we can do for our patients. And to understand the role of prevention of type 2 diabetes, the immunotherapy, the role of immunotherapy for the same, I would like to invite Dr. Nidhi Gar, who has worked in this field, is working in the research on various targets for type 1 diabetes, so that we can devise strategies in the form of various molecules to target those molecules to prevent type 1 diabetes or to cure type 1 diabetes. Dr. Nidhi has been trained in medicine and endocrinology at India in Delhi and Chandigarh. After that, she moved to Mayo Clinic uh, USA where she worked in the basic sciences and currently she is working in antibody engineering, drug discovery, designing and testing of genetically engineered various antibodies against novel targets for various diseases, including type 1 diabetes. So she will be the best person to speak about the role of immunotherapy for prevention of type 1 diabetes. Over to you, Dr. Niti. Thank you so much, Dr. Pratap, for giving a kind introduction. Uh, yeah, I would like to share the screen. Uh, is my screen visible? No, no matter. No? Okay. Um, At the bottom panel, bottom panel, there is a green. Button. Yeah. I...
Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I'm okay. Yeah. Um, so good morning, everybody. It's morning here, and uh, uh, transitioning from the basics of the uh, body mind, uh, uh, we will talk about the basics of the uh, type one diabetes. That is the beta cells and immunology. So it's a shift from body and mind to the basics of the immune system now. So let us start um, our uh, topic, the immunotherapy for type 1 diabetes. Sorry to interrupt you, madam, but make it slight shift. Slight shift. shift. Yes, yes. Exploring the etiopathogenesis of type 1 diabetes is like exploring an elephant blindfolded. Thousands of scientists all across the globe have been working tirelessly uh, to understand the etiopathogenesis of type 1 diabetes. They are working on various aspects of the disease. However, I, still, I believe that we are still quite far away from the clear vision and the complete view. Uh, so today, let us try to explore this huge elephant uh, in these next 20 minutes. So uh, let us try to make this attempt. I think it's still not. Uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Nidhi, can we do one thing? Uh, we can take the next talk and meanwhile, can you email this PPT so that we can read it from our end? Okay, okay. Yeah, I can do that. Rakesh, I so, think we, uh, she can do slideshow from the. Just do it tenor. slideshow. Yeah. Do it She's doing slide. it. Madam, She's in the upper it. panel, there is slideshow is written. If you see. Oh. Okay, I'm so sorry for all this technology problems and we are going to work about, talk about the technology now. Uh, so, uh, Next time we'll have a talk on this now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we should learn more from uh, the computer engineers. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so... Automatically. Type one <laughs> yeah, so type one, di 
Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay, let us start. So uh, what we all know so far is that type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition which is caused by the, uh, which leads to the destruction of the insulin producing pancreatic beta cells by the autoreactive T cells. And there are various genetic and environmental factors such as microbial infections, neonatal nutrition, and exposure to certain toxins, which is responsible for the triggering of the uh, whole process. In 1985, Dr. Boltazzo's lecture called Death of a Beta Cell, Homicide or Suicide, posed the idea of beta cell fragility for the first time. This means that the beta cells are, some beta cells are vulnerable to their own uh, destruction and damage. So in 1985, we got this idea for the first time. So whether these beta cells, they are innocent bystanders. So all these, for almost 100 years or almost all this time, we just knew that beta cells are the innocent bystanders. Uh, however, in the last few years or maybe one decade, our, our understanding about the beta cells have shifted. And uh, we, now we have an understanding. And from the recent research, we know that they are the equal partners in crime. So beta cells and autoimmune responses, they both, are, they both equally contribute to the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes and both, of, uh, and both the beta cells and, uh, and uh, autoimmune responses, they are the partners in crime. So let us, uh, from with this understanding, let us now try to explore the various beta cell mediated mechanisms and the T cell mediated mechanisms in the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes. There is enough evidence that the beta cells have an active role uh, in the in the pathogenesis because we have the evidence in the form of the lack of consistent long-term success with immune intervention therapies. The existence of islet autoimmunity in general population without the development of type 1 diabetes. And there is persistence of beta cells in patients of type 1 diabetes even after diagnosis and the progression of the disease. In normal health, beta cells, they respond to the glucose fluctuations by secreting appropriate amount of insulin to maintain the euglycemia, which is a taxing process in itself, even in healthy individuals. And in stressful conditions like inflammation and nutritional access, uh, access uh, the uh, beta cells they become more vulnerable. When there is an exposure to viral infections, cytokines, inflammation, or dysglycemia, there is a cellular response in the form of uh, endoplasmic reticulum stress, reactive oxygen species, leading to the changes in the protein, uh, protein formation and post-translation uh, protein modifications, leading to altered immunogenicity, T-cell and antibody responses, altered beta cell function, insulin misfolding, altered metabolism and impaired uh, sensing and release of the insulin, leading to a compromised unhappy beta cell. The various cellular mechanisms are endoplasmic reticulum stress, which results from high demand for protein production and secretion. This unresolved endoplasmic uh, reticulum stress causes accumulation of misfolded proteins, dysregulated post-translation modifications, and uh, eventually there is oxidative stress in the form of low levels of catalase, glutathione peroxidase, and uh, leading to the reactive oxygen species imbalance. The prolonged oxidative stress leads to increased le levels of reactive oxygen species which leads to decreased insulin secretion and cell death. The high vascularity is required for the distribution of proteins in the bloodstream. It also provides easy access to the inflammatory cells and the cytokines. So when the beta cells, they come under stress, there is a chemical, there, there is a release of these cytokines, insulitis, islet damage, and beta cell death. So why some beta cells are more prone for their demise or destruction as compared to others? Because there exists something called as beta cell heterogeneity. Uh, using the novel surface markers, we have found that human beta cells are uh, divided into beta 1 to beta 4, depending on the glucose responsiveness. So beta 1 are the most glucose responsive and beta 4 is the least responsive. Uh, the beta cells uh, also have the uh, hub cells, which are supposedly the pacemaker. And then they are the followers which respond after the hub cells and the virgin beta cells are in the islet periphery and uh, they are functionally immature. This study is called as neogenic niche and the new beta cells, uh, are, it says that the new beta cells are originating from the alpha cells and all these cells, they are the trans differentiation intermediates between the alpha and the beta cells. Another study uh, has shown that, uh, that beta cells are spatially organized and depending on the uh, physical distance from the first responder cells. 
there exists not just a functional heterogeneity, also there is a transcriptional diversity. The single cell transcriptomics and the FISH technology has allowed the exploration of beta cell heterogeneity, including the maturity, aging, and endoplasmic reticulum stress response. Uh, the first gene identified was the DLK1. And the other genes involved are the uh, in the endoplasmic reticulum and at oxidative stress. They are the strongest distinguishers of this beta cell subpopulation. The beta cells themselves contribute to the, in, in, uh, to the inflammation, uh, inflammation. So the beta cells, they produce the inflammatory cytokines, CCL2, CCL5, and CXCL10, which when uh, exposed to the inflammatory conditions or environmental triggers, the beta cells, they start producing these inflammatory cytokines. It leads to the recruitment of the immune cells, leading to insulitis, and these immune cells can damage the beta cells by synthesizing the reactive oxygen species, the inflammatory cytokines. Uh, the single nucleotide polymorphisms, these are the genes uh, which are associated with the uh, pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes. The fine uh, mapping of the loci using immunochip method has uh, shown different SNPs uh, or the SNPs. The HLA loci is the, is the one which is strongly associated with the disease and the T-cell autoreactivity. The SNPs in the insulin gene remain one of the highest risk. risk. And 60% of the patients uh, of type 1 diabetes have SNPs in the insulin gene. Other SNPs which have been identified are, uh, are DLK1 and C-type uh, lectin domain family 16. The various T-cell mechanisms along with the beta cell mechanisms are also involved. And we have enough clinical, genetic, histopathological, immune-mediated in vitro and ex vivo uh, evidence that T-cell play an important role in the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes. This picture looks a little bit complicated, but let's start from here, how the various immune system, how our immune system, it attacks a beta cell and leads to the depletion of the beta cells. So in type 1 diabetic susceptible individual in the pancreatic lymph node, when there is an environmental trigger in the form of any viral infection, there is a breakdown in the peripheral tolerance. So the CD4 and the CD8 T cells, they become activated and they start releasing the inflammatory cytokines. The beta cell specific T cells and B cells migrate to the islets and initiate the beta cell damage and death. The dendritic cells, they migrate to the lymph nodes and present the beta cell autoantigens, that is GAD65 and insulin to the NAV CD4 and CD8 cells. And it leads to further release of the inflammatory cytokines. So this process keeps repeating and gradually the beta cells, they keep on getting depleted. Uh, eventually, the, uh, the beta cell uh, mass reduces, uh, very little beta cell mass remains and because in this pro-inflammatory environment, resulting in elevated blood sugar levels and clinically over type 1 diabetes. So after understanding the basics of the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes, let us now try to explore the various immunotherapies we have so far. In 1922, Almost 100 years ago, first time insulin was introduced. And since uh, one century, the insulin remains the mainstay of the treatment in type 1 diabetes. However, in 1982, cyclosporine for the first time showed efficacy in reversing new onset type 1 diabetes. Since then, many immunotherapies have been uh, tried and tested in, the, uh, in type 1 diabetes. In, uh, and this field continues to evolve as our understanding about the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes is improving. There are therapies which are directed towards the beta cells and towards the immune system. And there are therapies in both the, uh, which have been tried in both the human beings and also in the animal models. Uh, however, only a few therapies have made their way from uh, bench side to the bedside. So the beta cell directed therapies includes the modulation of the endoplasmic reticulum induced beta cell death. Uh, there are two main drugs, uh, torsodeoxycholic acid and imatinib misylate. The torsodeoxycholic acid is a naturally occurring bile acid which can reduce the ER stress. In the mice model, it has improved the glucose tolerance, in, increased the beta cell mass and improved the glycemia. Imatinib misylate is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And in, in mice model, it has reversed the autoimmune diabetes. In clinical trial, imatinib has preserved the beta cell function at 12 months in adults with recent onset type 1 diabetes. 
and further studies are ongoing for the safety of in children. In targeting the oxidative stress, is targeting the thioredoxin interacting protein, which is an inhibitor of the detoxification pathway. Insulin and metformin were found to increase the degradation of TXNIP. Similarly, virapamil, a calcium channel blocker, has decreased the TXNIP and enhanced the beta cell survival in both the humans and the rodent islets. In the clinical trial, virapamil along with insulin promoted the beta cell function and lowered the exogenous insulin requirement. Stem cell therapy is another way to enhance the beta cell mass. Human stem cells for clinical use offer a long-term solution for type 1 diabetes without the challenge of organ shortage and HLA mismatch. Uh, clinical trials by Viacite and CRISPR therapeutics are in progress. And there's a special talk, uh, next talk is on, uh, is on stem cells. Then the immune directed therapies consist of mostly the monoclonal antibodies. The monoclonal antibodies are of two types, depleting and non-depleting type. The depleting monoclonal antibodies, uh, they bind and promote the apoptosis of the immune effector cells. However, the non-depleting monoclonal antibodies, they neutralize they bind and the uh, they bind they neutralize and they modulate the various properties of the uh, immune effector cells without the destruction of the immune immune cells so these are the various targets uh, on the t cells b cells and the t regulatory cells uh, where, where different monoclonal antibodies have been tested in type 1 diabetes and let us discuss uh, one by one so anti cd3 therapy this is the most successful clinical immunotherapy for type 1 diabetes so far. Uh, first used in 1994 in the non-obese diabetic mice, it reversed the new onset diabetes, established long-term remission and beta cell specific tolerance. However, when it was translated to the uh, clinical trials in human beings, in phase one and two uh, clinical, in the phase one and the two, 14 days of teplizumab, uh, when it was given to newly diagnosed type 1 diabetic uh, it failed to show the reversal of diabetes. However, in the teplizumab treated group, over a period of two years, the C peptide responses and insulin production was sustained, which correlated with the decreased HPA1C and insulin dependency. In phase three trials, teplizumab did not meet even the primary endpoint goal. In the post hoc analysis, it showed a reduced loss of C peptide in subset of patients receiving teplizumab. In 2019, a new randomized double-blind placebo-controlled teplizumab trial, it addressed the safety and tolerability of the treatment in recent onset type 1 diabetes. In a recent phase 2 trial in high-risk non-diabetic relatives of type 1 diabetes patients, it investigated the efficacy of teplizumab to prevent diabetes onset. Subjects who rece uh, receiving a 14-day course of teplizumab exhi exhibited an average delay of 24 months in the onset of diabetes. Uh, another uh, anti-CD3 uh, drug, uh, otolexizumab, it preserves the beta cell function and reduces the insulin use of four years in phase two placebo controlled trial. However, it was terminated in phase three because it failed to improve the C-peptide levels uh, with a reduced dosage. And it uh, also caused reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus in some of the subjects. The anti-CD20 therapy is mainly rutuximab a mouse human chimeric IgG monoclonal antibody. After one year of treatment, there was an improvement in the levels of HbA1c and C-peptide, uh, as well as the requirement for insulin, indicating that there was a beta cell function was preserved. However, there was no long-term benefit after two years, and uh, further studies are needed for the timing and dosage of rituximab. The anti-CD2 therapy, uh, a 12 and 24 months clinical trial with recent onset type 1 diabetes demonstrated a reduced frequency of activated T cells. Uh, additionally, C peptide levels were improved after a mixed meal test in Elifacept group. And uh, this correlated with the reduced exogenous insulin requirements and suggested that Elifacept prolongs the beta cell function. Uh, the non depleting monoclonal antibodies uh, it neutralizes the soluble immune effector molecules. The pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1 beta, interferon gamma, and TNF-alpha are cytotoxic to the beta cells. Uh, therapies against the interleukin-1, that is canakinimab and anakindra, were found to be ineffective. However, the anti-TNF-alpha drug, etanocept, has demonstrated efficacy based on reduced HbA1c levels in recently diagnosed children. An ongoing phase 2 trial is testing etanocept in 
combination with vitamin D plus GAD65 prepared in alum adjuvant. The goal here is to suppress the islet inflammation. Symphony, which is a neutralizing antibody that binds the TNF-alpha, is also investigated to maintain the uh, beta cell mass. Uh, in, in the non-obese diabetic mouse, the various monoclonal antibodies against the targets like interferon alpha, interleukin-12, interleukin-21, interleukin-17, and interleukin-25 have so far shown promising results. Modulating the immune effector cell activity, a Abatacept, uh, an anti-CTLF4 immunoglobulin fusion protein, it slows the beta cell functional decline and improves HbA1c levels in new onset type 1 diabetes, although insulin ind independence was not achieved with Abatacept. And in the non-obese diabetic mice, targeting the T-cell receptor CD4 and CD8 prevents and reverses diabetes. Uh, the monoclonal antibody cytokine complexes mostly consist of the interleukin-2 therapy, and so far in the mouse model, it is, uh, it is shown to be effective. The bispecific monoclonal antibodies contains two distinct antigen binding sites, and uh, the classical example is the beta cell specific uh, GLUT2 and the T cell inhibitory receptor CTLA4, which has been tested in the uh, non obese diabetic mice. And it has reduced the T cell proliferation, cytokine production, and decreased the diabetes incident. Combination therapies are there uh, in which the two drugs from the two different categories are uh, combined. However, most of the data uh, is from the preclinical and from the mouse models. Uh, there is very little data on the uh, human trials from combination therapies. So to conclude, the ultimate goal of an immunotherapy for type 1 diabetes is to suppress the ongoing beta cell autoimmunity without affecting the uh, protective immunity and preserve the beta cell function. Clinical therapies targeting the T and the B cells via the CD, anti-CD3 and anti-CD20, that is teplizumab and rituximab, have demonstrated safety and efficacy in maintaining the beta cell mass in newly diagnosed patients. The efficacy of monoclonal antibodies in type 1 diabetes depends on the timing of the intervention in relation to the disease progression. Uh, thank you for the kind attention. And, uh, and just a glimpse of like, this is the technology on which I am working uh, currently at Mayo Clinic. Uh, and this is our technology in which we are designing the uh, SCFE antibodies. This is all, uh, like novel technology and we are targeting the like novel target, targets with our technology. And uh, uh, our antibodies are much smaller than the monoclonal antibodies. The technique by which we are designing and making our antibodies is different from the uh, monoclonal antibodies. And uh, most of the targets are like novel targets on which we are working. So, uh, I mean, this is uh, totally on the animals right now. There is no translation so far on the on the human uh, uh, trials or any, any human beings. This is totally on the uh, mouse, which we are working right now. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nidhi, madam, for excellent overview of immunotherapy and what are the various agents which are available currently for prevention of type 2 diabetes and your innovative area of research of very small uh, antibody molecules which you are designing and probably in near future, we will be hearing more about those molecules. I will request my co-chair, Dr. Raka, to introduce the second speaker and the second topic. Yeah, sure. Thankful to Dr. Bansi, sir, for accommodating me in this technology conference. And thank you, thank you for sensitizing all of us to this new techno world. And here comes a new techno man, Dr. Rajaram J. Karne from our own India. And he's affiliated with VA Central OEO Medical Center. He's a technology man behind CMS Stage 1 EHR reporting in 2013. He has many publications to his credit. He is certified from medical school and residency from Clinical Center at the National Institutes of Health. Fellowships from National Institute of Health Clinical Center. He's an American Board of Inter uh, Medi Medicine graduate certified in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism. He, he has uh, been licensed to practice in OEO and in US, active throughout 2022, and he'll be sensitizing us, giving the wisdom regarding stem cells therapy in diabetes and how we can approach. Earlier, there were 
era of infection, then there comes the era of antibody. Now we are treating autoimmunity and all things with all possible and plausible modalities. Let's uh, congratulate Dr. Rajaram for his own good deliberation on this stem cells. Hello, good morning and good evening there. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure, sir. Awesome. So let me get the share screen and I'll get the PowerPoint. Do you see the slides? Yeah. Yes. Okay, sir. awesome. So uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Jaitwani. And my own best introduction is I am from KM Hospital, Mumbai. I did my DM there. And that's why I know most of you people. And I'm still, <clears throat> once you are from Mumbai, you are always from Mumbai. Okay. <laughs> So today we are going to talk about uh, stem cell and uh, gene therapy. Now, uh, both of these topics have uh, too many cellular and biochemical words that we clinicians uh, really don't understand. It's a different language. But how we use it clinically, what does it make sense to a clinician? I have tried to get overview and because these both the topics are so huge, getting into 20 minutes is a challenge and we'll see how it goes, okay? So the currently the type one diabetes, and that's what mostly we're going to talk about, is uh, treated mainly by the exogenous insulin. That's the state of the art today. We are doing a lot better, almost close to the um, real natural uh, physiological secretion, but, uh, we are working on the other modalities, which is pancreas and allied cell transplantation, which is taking up huge uh, leaps in the development. And Dr. Gar gave an excellent talk on the immunotherapy. That's another development happening. So now what we are looking at is a stem cell therapy. And there are different ways in which you can do the in vitro development of either islet cell themselves or the other cells that produce insulin, which is IPCs, insulin producing cells. Then there is another arm of gene therapy where we can do the gene editing and the genetic vaccines, etc. <clears throat> Just to say that gene therapy, immunotherapy, and stem cells, they are not mutually exclusive. There is a lot of overlap, as Dr. Garak was mentioning, and we will see it again. So some terminologies in the stem cells is IPC means insulin-producing cells. They could be islets, they could be islet organized, organoids, or they could be non islet cells producing insulin. They come from human stem cells, which are truly potent and can develop into any of the adult cells. One of the sources is embryonic stem cells, which are coming from the inner cell mass of the blastocytes, and they have infinite proliferative or renewal capacity. Uh, second one is a human induced pluripotent cell, which means they are somatic cells, but they are reprogrammed to become stem cells and then differentiate into islet cells. Uh, they have a similar capacity to proliferate, but advantage is the embryonic cell run into ethical issues of using human embryos, while in the somatic cell transformation, we don't get the ethical issues. <clears throat> then there are the stem cells derived from the grown-up adults. And one very interesting Transdifferentiation, where the cell is already differentiated, and instead of going back to islet cell, it directly transdifferentiates into a different kind of cell. So there are a lot of modalities going on. Now, the steps involved from in the pancreas uh, embryonic life, from earliest uh, uh, embryonic stem cells to becoming the beta cell. There are a lot of these names that I have written at the bottom are the transcription factors and they start getting more and more complicated and delicate as we go forward to the endodermal cells, which in embryologically develops into a primitive gut, which then for gut becomes a bud that develops into pancreatic endoderm and that develops into the uh, both endocrine and exocrine precursors. And we are interested in endocrine precursor, which is eventually immature beta cell and mature beta cell. So as you see, the factors that are involved in each of this stage start becoming very specific, delicate, and complicated. So what are the methods that they use for stem cell? Is <clears throat> either 
you generate insulin from directly embryonic cells. So we actually use embryonic cells, transplant them, and see whether they can develop insulin. Or you can develop some steps from embryonic cells to progenitor cells, like steps in between in vitro, and then transfer it. And then there is a very interesting chimeras. Now, this is strictly animal models, but what they did is, in a rat, they blocked the development of pancreas by PDX1. We'll talk about that. And then they introduced some mouse embryonic cells, which developed mouse pancreas inside a rat, reaching the rat size. So that's very like sci-fi type uh, uh, thing, developing the chimeras. And then the pancreatic duct itself has the stem cells, which has more potential to become islet cells under experimental conditions. And then there is a different way. Instead of going from the embryonic cells, we go from the adult stem cells to differentiate. Either the stem cell come from liver, mesenchyme, or bone marrow. Now, out of them, the most promising and most investigated field comes from the mesenchymal cells. Again, these are the mesodermal cells, and we are trying to get the product of the endoderm. So that's where the power of the stem cell comes, that they can differentiate. So little focus on these mesenchymal derived cells that not only they become islets or try to become uh, islet, they also have a side benefit of promoting regeneration of the existing beta cells. So all you know that at the type one development, we still have a 20% beta cells. So mesenchymal derived stem cells actually have a benefit on the regeneration of the existing beta cells. It also protects the cells from the apoptosis, and they are, uh, if they are coming from the bone marrow, they have a potential for immunomodulation, which means they decrease the attack from the immune side of it. They actually help for the tissue repair. So this is something that has a lot more promise. And as I said, it converts into insulin producing cells under differentiating protocols. Another source, you can get the mesenchymal cells from umbilical cord. And they are better because they have more embryonic markers and endodermal lineages. And they have a very similar to the stem cells, but they are easy to get and have more potential. They also have a less immunogenicity. Now, just very interesting that all this we talked about type one. And if you look at the top two, like differentiation into insulin producing cells, and the promoting the regeneration of islets, they are wonderful for type one. On the lower left, they actually have a benefit for both type one and type two because they have an antioxidant capacity. And we know that the inflammation is one of the uh, cause of insulin resistance. But most interestingly, on the right side, they directly decrease the insulin resistance uh, by activating post receptor pathway through IRS signaling. So this mesenchymal cells can potentially be used for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. A brief touch on the clinical trial. There is only one I have picked up uh, that was done between 9 and 10 with 42 patients, uh, half randomized to placebo or standard care. <clears throat> and they followed for one year at three months interval to check the C-peptide area under the curve at the end of one year. Now, this is a complicated style, but just to make it simple, the top curve is a C-peptide area under the curve, which got better. So there was more C-peptide. This one is a hemoglobin A1C, which got better. Fasting glucose got better. And the insulin levels, which was measured, they got better. So this was one of the <clears throat> positive trials, but there are a bunch of them. And if we try to do the meta-analysis or review of the trial, there was one published recently with 15 trials, six from type one and nine from type two. And they looked at the same three endpoints, C-peptide, A1C, and exogenous insulin. Interestingly, in type 2 patients, it was a favorable benefit with uh, um, all three endpoints. But the problem was, within the trial, different trials, there was a huge uh, heterogeneity, which means the splay was too much. Interestingly, in type 1, there was no significant difference except for a little bit on A1C. So as we stand today, um, the stem cell therapy for type uh, diabetes is not so effective in type 1, maybe in type 2, 
but this can change rapidly as we know. The limitations are generation of functional beta cells in vitro, improvement the differentiation, how to protect them from the immune cell destruction, how to generate a sufficient cell to achieve the insulin dependence. So this is one of the mm, stick areas where you require a tremendous amount of funding to manage these delicate cells and to try. There was uh, one gentleman I met from the California lab who we were working on, they said he was burning 2 million a month and still have not reached to the say, stage two or three of the differentiation. So this is where we are. A uh, lot of research, a lot of funding is needed for this. So in summary, stem cell is a promising potential therapeutic model. There have been significant advances and improved chances of cure because all we need is just one or two breakthroughs that could change the whole picture and not yet promising in clinical trial. It was a very rapid review, but we are switching here to the gene therapy. And again, I'm giving a broad overview and not going into the nitty gritties because of the time. So introduction is the aim of gene therapy is to correct the defective gene or add the useful gene. And the techniques involved are either you over product, over express the gene or over express the protein production of the gene, or you transplant the cells that have the desired genes. And this is where the stem cell and gene they overlap and immunology overlap because we can uh, use the gene therapy to modulate immune uh, response and improve the diabetes. So the first mod is a gene overexpression. Uh, there are different genes on the candidate. Uh, they have been studied in animal models and cellular lines to improve the diabetes uh, features. One of them is IGF-1, which has a, a ability to improve the beta cell survival and actually mitogen to produce more. It also has a, some effect on immune function. The other pro genes are rec 3 g genes and hepatocyte growth factors. They both improve the survival, while glucose 6-phosphatase gene improves the glucose utilization. And then there is a big interest in the anti-aging gene, clotho gene, which, if it is absent, is shown to cause more beta cell apoptosis. So if you can overexpress these genes, they show promising effect on type 1 diabetes. Protein overexpression, on the other hand, where we are actually inducing the gene, but they are um, producing more amount of proteins, neurogenin-3, uh, then alpha-1 antitrypsin, glucokinase, leptin, and PDX. These are the um, candidates are being studied. The most interesting is the PDX. Uh, it is a transcriptional activator of several genes, and without which we cannot develop the pancreas. It's absolutely essential for pancreatic development and sustenance of the gene. But if we give that gene through the adenovirus, it actually led to severe hepatitis in the mouse models. So we have to be careful on using this gene therapy, um, especially on the safety issue. There is one very striking um, mechanism where we combine the gene therapy with genetic engineering, which is very interesting. What they do is, they take the mouse GIP gene and link it to the human insulin gene and then uh, implant it. There, these mice, the K cell from their gut, they start producing human insulin. So it's, a, it's not just a gene therapy, but we are combining the genetic engineering into that. Another one is a human adipose tissue engineered with PDX gene. Now that's the gene required for the differentiation. And we see that those adipose tissue cells now are secreting insulin. Switching the next mechanism is Dr. Garg mentioned as immune interventions um, are very promising in development of or the treatment of diabetes. So we can use the gene therapy to modulate the immune responses. One of the ways we do that is we actually modify the precursor cell. So before a T cell become um, toxic, what we do is we transfer the gene off into that precursor cell to modulate it so that the antigen is recognized as a cell and autoimmunity is not developed. It basically prevents the CD8 T cells from attack on islet express antigens. The other way to do that is 
targeting the gene therapy to the T receptor on the islet cell. So basically, the T receptor will not attack the islet cell. And one more mechanism is we modify the cytokines. So basically, the T cell producing cytokines are either if they are bad, they are um, suppressed, or if they are good, like I10 and 15, they are more produced. So in this way, the gene therapy can modify the immune uh, function that would help the diabetes. There are other approaches. One is a transplantation of the cell expressing genes against type 1 diabetes. Now here, we are the bone marrow cells, dendritic cells, and they have an autoimmune regulator gene, which will decrease the, I would say, again, toxic T cells. So it leads to the deletion of autoreactive T cells and decrease the autoimmunity. And it also prevents the epitope spreading, which uh, epitope spreading means <clears throat> If you have an autoimmunity against a particular cell or protein, over the time, the other unrelated cells <clears throat> or the proteins, they start becoming um, reactive to the same autoimmunity. That process accelerates out multiple autoimmune disorders, and we can prevent that by this transplantation theoretically. Then there is a genetic vaccination, which is the same principle that we use in COVID mRNA vaccine. But here we are using the plasmid DNAs, which can produce a specific neutralizing antibody that would prevent the toxic immune response. So the most common method used to add the genes or use the gene therapy are the viral vectors. And they are made non-pathogenic by muting their replication. But at the same time, the ability to transfer the gene is kept intact. Again, it all sounds like a sci-fi uh, novel, but it is actually being in works. And, uh, and the way that the virus goes inside the cell by endocytosis, and the adenovirus is the, the most commonly used, most widely used. It is safe, effective. Uh, although almost all the gene therapy in practice are done by the adeno. And then there are other viruses like retro, herpes simplex, Epstein-Barr, and lentivirus. The still there, Animal models have worked pretty really well. We still have the concern on the toxicity, inflammation, and immunogenicity in the humans. So that's where a lot of development is focused. The non viral vectors are uh, either physical by giving the gene gun, you mechanically um, like inject the genes, or we can use the plasmid, as I said, they are the small extrasomal DNA molecules independent of chromosomes and they can replicate, so we can use them. They, you can use the chemical polymers, you can use the electroporation. These are all methods are non-viral and they are safe, obviously non-immunogenic. They are not as effective as the viral methods. So in summary, there are multiple approaches are being used to manipulate the genes to treat the diabetes. By overexpression of genes and proteins, genetic engineering, transplantation of stem cells, vaccinations, immunology, and vectors can be viral or non-viral. The limitations are, it may, they may trigger unnecessary immune response. Almost all studies are in the animal model and safety is not established in humans. So the question was, is it a mirage or an oasis? As it, we stand today, I could say that it is still a mirage. We see something there, we are going there, but who knows, in next 10 years, we will be sitting back again and as I said, one or two breakthroughs can completely change the picture, and we could call it as we are in OSS. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Rajaram, for nice deliberation on such a complex topic. In, in, in a limited time, it's very difficult to decipher all these things. We, we, we are stunned to have such a uh, miraculous thing around the world. And we are thankful that we are doing still, although it is miragosis rather than mirage and osis, it's miragosis, waiting for some miracle. Uh, I'll introduce Dr. Jetwani to go further to introduce our near, next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Raka. I think we are moving to the third topic of the cellular therapies, that whether we can use this stem cells or exosomes as biomarkers in the field of diabetes. And we have none other than Dr. Sabia Sachi Sen, who is professor of medicine from George Washington University. 
After completing his graduation and post graduation from the city of Kolkata, he has done too many academic accolades to his credit. He has done MRCP from UK, Ireland, from London, diploma in geriatric medicine, diploma in sports medicine. And apart from medicine and medical education, he is also skilled in clinical research, life sciences, and clinical trials. So over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, hope you guys can hear me and see me. Let me try to share my screen. Uh, and it would be this one. Okay. I hope you can see me. Yes, sir. Awesome. Can you see my slides in full yes. screen? Awesome. So uh, thank you for inviting me and thanks for Bangsi and uh, Dr. Jitwani, Dr. Shahor and Dr. Parikh for inviting me. I personally have met many of you and talked to many of you over the years and uh, hopefully uh, this collaboration will continue. And uh, so uh, Dr. Carney, was also in NIH with me a couple of years before me. So he actually did a fantastic job of setting up the stage for me uh, for to talk about stem cells, not only for therapy, but for use as a biomarker for our patients that we treat every day. And hopefully this will become a reality to know who responds to what uh, in individualized medicine. As you know, everybody throughout the world is trying to figure out how we can individualize therapy and medicine. Dr. Uh, Sid, if you can change the view, uh, I think we are seeing two slides, the current slide as well as the next slide right now. Is there any alternative view here? Uh, yeah, just try that, please. Uh, no, no. Uh, okay, it's uh, better. It's better, but then... Uh, uh, I think this is better. Dr. Pratap, is it okay? Let me try to close this slide. Uh, I hope this wouldn't close everything, but uh, let me try. Uh, I think you shared the whole screen, so maybe if you share the PPT alone, then we can see. Uh, okay. You, you can change the way of your slideshow. blood cells after you spin down the blood. Uh, and from that, you put it through a magnetic bead column to get CD34 positive cells. So CD is essentially a cell surface marker. And these have been shown to have progenitor capabilities. Uh, and the other one that I'm going to talk about, and then uh, Dr. Carney already mentioned, is mesenchymal stromal cells. This looks like spin shaped cells like this one. So the progenitor cells, which are CD34 positive, are also, uh, if you sort it again, can be VEGF receptor positive, which is a vascular endothelial growth factor positivity. So if these are both positive, then it's clearly going towards a vascular lineage. So it comes out from the bone marrow with certain, in response to certain chemotactic factors, and it sits down in a blood vessel to form the endothelium. So as you can imagine, the critical uh, components that a stem cell needs to have is it needs to be able to move in response to a chemotactic factor in order to assimilate in an endothelial lining. And unfortunately, that's impaired in diabetes. It doesn't move fast enough. 
uh, its uh, num numbers are low because the high glucose kills these cells and so on and so forth. So, and it has been shown by multiple investigators over a period of time that these cells truly mature with different changes in the cell surface and phenotype, and they do uh, assimilate in the cell surface for endothelial uh, lining once the uh, mother endothelium is damaged. So as you can imagine, these are very critical cells. This uh, was first uh, discovered by our group by Jeff Isner way back in the science paper in 1997. And subsequently our group has done numerous studies on these cells. Uh, these are, as you can see, ENOS positive or nitric oxide synthase positive, CD31 positive later on, such as HUVEC, and these cells become positive at day 14 and so on. So these are truly CD34 to begin with at day seven, which subsequently become day CD31, which is a mature endothelial cell surface marker. And you need these cells to essentially assimilate. Now these cells have a lot of properties such as it produces a lot of growth factors and so on. But in clinical medicine, you need to see whether these cells, after you give a therapy, whether the endothelium is getting any better or its progenitors are getting any better, right? That's the whole reason why we are treating our patients. Uh, so, which means its migration needs to improve, it needs to be able to home in to form the, or repair the endothelium, right? And so the other component here is that the formation of colony count, and this has been, uh, shown in clinical trials multiple times that these seems to be a, a robust cardiovascular risk indicator. These are usually 14 to 16 in a normal uh, patient who doesn't have diabetes, and these are almost always reduced in diabetes and prediabetes, indicating that they cannot form a colony, which is the first step towards forming a vasculature. Uh, so with that in mind, I'll go to our first trial that we devised way back when I was a faculty at uh, Tufts, uh, just after my fellowship at uh, NIH. And uh, this was done in conjunction with uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst uh, from exercise physiologists there. We designed a crossover exercise intervention trial. Uh, this was, I believe, funded by American Heart. So, and uh, we had a, a six weeks non-exercise, sorry, six weeks exercise moving to non-exercise or it's starting with non-exercise moving to exercise. So period A is about six weeks. We have a washer period of, of four weeks and then they again exercise or no exercise depending on the group they cross over to, right? And the exercise simply was what is currently mandated by ADA is a combination of aerobic exercise and uh, some resistance. This was actually purely aerobic exercise for 150 minutes per week. These were all pre-diabetes patients and all of them were office goers and had regular job. None was so-called sedentary, had sedentary lifestyle, right? So very normal patient population that we usually get. So in these patients, pre and post exercise, the white bar is at a non-exercise phase and the black bar is an exercise phase. As you can see, the number of progenitor cells are definitely higher in patients who exercised even for six weeks. And, and so that was quite interesting that even with small possibility of exercise, their CD count, the progenitor cells go, went up and the colony count, which was as low, this was actually quite interesting that it went down to as low as four and five as opposed to normal patients. So even pre-diabetes, the colony count is so low and that it responds fairly fast to almost eight and nine post-exercise. So dramatic cell-based changes. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the gene changes. Uh, some classic ones such as interleukin-6 uh, went down with exercise, uh, apoptosis gene went down, ENOS went up and so on. 
So the reason I'm showing this is for twofold. A, there is a, we, I'm showing not only that it responds to exercise, but the fact that you can actually use these cells to discern who responded and who didn't. Now, clearly, of that entire exercise population, not everybody would have responded to the same degree. But here you have a modality where you can check whether a particular patient is responding or not. Now, clearly, these tests are not for everybody. But if somebody wants to know and has and can support these extra tests, I think it's worth doing. But when you actually, the other interesting part was when we looked at the accelerometer data from all these patients, as you can see, none of these patients at home did any vigorous exercise. None of these patients either in any arm did any even moderate exercise. What they did was probably change their lifestyle, which means they were less sedentary, which means they were more fidgeting. They tried to do more. And that alone was enough in a pre-diabetes state for cell-based changes. Now, if you, we looked at a lot of biochemistry, it didn't change a huge lot. And you know, when we do clinical medicine, it doesn't, IL-6 hardly changes, right? But here you have a modality which clearly showed some differences. Uh, let's, this was obviously published. Let me move on to another study that we did. This was a fat-based uh, MSC. So we, again, this was a pre-diabetic population, A1C between, uh, uh, between 5.9 to 6.4, uh, BMI, which was mostly overweight, uh, age more than 40. We had a pre-exercise and post-exercise fat biopsies. Uh, it was used by a biopsy gun uh, without any incision uh, so that uh, there was not much scar and so on and so forth. So once you culture these cells over a 14-day period, you actually do get a spindle-shaped cell population. Uh, then you sort these patients based on some surface markers, continue to go for another 14 days, and you get a very homogeneous, nicely growing population individualized cell-based uh, assay, right? Now, mesenchymal stromal cells can differentiate into fat, this adipocyte, bone, or cartilage, right? So the question is, how and why does it change from one or the other? Now, clearly, we don't want it to produce a lot of adipocytes. We do want it to continue to make bones and cartilage and muscle, right? So. Uh, when we did the gene an analysis again from these cells pre and post exercise, clearly there was more VEGF, more KDR and ENOS with exercise. A lot of antioxidants went up, which is fine, which is what we showed in the previous test. This is actually easier cell to get than the blood. Uh, I mean, it's not, these are more abundant, I should say. Uh, it, blood may be more easier. But the other interesting fact that we also got their cell endothelial progenitor cells from the blood, right? So this was the normal cell culture. This was essentially on exposure to adipogenic media. As you can see, these red blobs are essentially fat forming vacuoles inside the cell, right? And this is essentially when you add the conditioned media or the secretome from the progenitor cells, from the CD34 blood derived progenitor cells, you're adding them on the fat based cell culture in presence of adipogenic media, right? As you can see, these blobs have disappeared. Okay, so clearly, these post exercise cells are producing a secretome which actually can prevent adipogenesis. This is almost the first time we showed that there is a direct inhibition of adipogenesis with cell-based secretome post-exercise in prediabetes. If you look at that in, in adipogenic and post-adipogenic with ECM, endogenic condition media, most of the fat genes like FABP4, PGC1 alpha, CBP alpha, PPAR gamma, these are significantly reduced. 
in gene expression. Again, KDR was higher and so on and so forth. So this is actually an interesting study. And remember, this is not a long-term study. This is fast and quick. You can go in and test these in a fairly relatively short period of time. Again, this is published. Uh, let me show you one more study. Uh, this was using SGLT2, uh, which is canagliflozin, low dose. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff about SGLT2. Uh, so we did a 16-week intervention with, with uh, canagliflozin of uh, 15 patients with uh, the medication and with placebo. This was a uh, blinded placebo-matched study. Uh, this was uh, funded by American Diabetes Association and uh, in conjunction with our uh, placebo, which was made from um, Janssen. And I'm showing you the blood pressure. Uh, as you can see, there was a sharp drop, which came close, but this drop alone is quite helpful for patients. Adiponectin actually went steadily up. It actually went down in placebo. Uh, IL-6 clearly went down, and this is only in 16 weeks. As you can see, there's a sharp drop. Uh, this was close to statistical significance. Uh, migration of the cell-based assays, there was an upward trend. If you continue, it will probably diverge more. Uh, CXCR4 is a chemotactic factor receptor, which the stem cells respond to. And that went up quite significantly and showed a statistical significant difference, which matches with this one. Uh, we looked at the exosomes in this study. Now we are going into the exosomes as a biomarker. So the exosomes are essentially small packages of secretion from different cells, right? The exosomes could be in blood, could be in urine, could be in CSF, could be in any fluid that we have. So exosomes when for, could be a various sizes. You have to actually know what the clinical trial is specifically looking at. We looked at 50 to 150 nanometers, okay, which is classified as so-called EVs. So these are essentially how one cell would cross talk with another cell. And the hallmarks would be gene regulation, angiogenesis, wound healing, and so on. So there has been a lot of work on exosomes and how this cargo, differences in this cargo that the exosome has can show the response or as a therapy and or as a biomarker. So when we looked at the exosomes in the canagliflozin study, remember this was a low dose canagliflozin study in, pre, in type two diabetes, not prediabetes. And the one that showed very clear trend was a podocalyxin. Now, what are these? These are nephrine podocalyxin. These are proteins produced from podocytes. And these are, as you know, in diabetic nephropathy or diabetes per se, we look at albuminuria all the time. But that protein is very non-specific. However, we know in diabetes that there is podocyte damage. So these are podocyte-based proteins. The higher they are, the higher the inflammation of the podocyte is. And this has been shown by other labs. And what we showed for the first time that in canagliflozin, there's a clearly a drop coming up with podocalyxin and possibly also nephrine in a uh, small study that we conducted. We are actually conducting a large study now with empagliflozin. Let me come to COVID. You cannot have a talk in this day and age without COVID. And I'm not going to uh, bore you with lots of data about what's COVID, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know that uh, there's cell surface receptors and so on and so forth. What we did essentially was we were interested in long COVID. In other words, uh, what would happen if you had COVID, had resolution of symptoms, but then what happens at 10 weeks, six months, and 12 months out, right, using these markers. Uh, I'm going to skip that. What we did show was even if these patients, these patients were not diabetic, okay, 
But when we looked at their blood glucose levels, their blood glucose levels were clearly higher than what would be for a diabetes patient at random values. Now you can say, well, random values doesn't mean much. But at the same time, when we got their blood, their blood sugars at 10 weeks and six months post-COVID, these were not diagnosed to have A1C of more than 6.5. Their random blood sugar levels were higher. Now, clearly, this is probably not fasting, but just a uh, correlative sign. So based on that, we looked at the number of mononuclear cells and, and the progenitor cells, and clearly, even compared to a type 2 diabetes patient with mononuclear cells, as you can see, even at 10 weeks and six months, the cells or infection-fighting cells or progenitor cell pool is significantly lower. So there's something going on that is not even close to a type 2 diabetes patient, which is, of course, stable. When you compare the CFU colonies, it's actually very surprising that these patients who are 10 weeks and six months out of COVID had their colony count almost as similar to a type two diabetes patient, which is 10 to 11. Remember a normal one should be somewhere here. So none of them had, even they were no, not known to be diabetic, had a poor colony count. That alone tells you that they have some cardiovascular risk, which is kind of unidentified. So we looked at the urine exosomes. Why? Because as you know, we were getting signals that these patients probably are developing metabolic dysfunction. And as you know, microalbuminuria or proteinuria is almost the first uh, clinical scenario that happens. And we wanted to look at what happens to their protocyte markers. Again, looking at uh, nephrine, podocalyxin, uh, and here you see that the nephrine, uh, when, done, when controlled to a standard exosome marker, is a ratio, 10 weeks, six months, 12 months, compared to a type two diabetes patient. As you can see, there is a sick, I mean, type two diabetes patient actually has very lower protocyte damage. And this damage or the protocyte inflammation is continuing. It's not only really just scary that it's there at 10 weeks or six months, it's actually continuing up to 12 months post COVID. Now you can say that why is this so low? Well, maybe in type two diabetes, the protocytes are already damaged by that time completely. But the fact that it's way higher than type two diabetes levels, statistical signal, and the levels are persistently high at 12 months. We are now doing a VA study which is going to look, which is looking at 18 months and two years, because this is actually scary, if you ask me. And we have medications that we can put in for early signs of kidney damage, which we don't do right now. If you look at another uh, biomarker, podocalyxin, same story. If you, when we looked at two different uh, experiments, here we have a total of 23, 24, same trend. Uh, There's a combination of the two experiments, a total of 47 patients, same trend. It's actually getting scarier when you pool all the data. So this is unpublished. Please don't, uh, it's not for wide circulation yet. We are just, this is essentially data from last week. Uh, but I thought that this should be portrayed out there because there is signs of kidney damage, long-term kidney damage in post COVID or long COVID patients. So, uh, and it's based on exosomes, which probably we would have missed if we just looked at albuminuria in these patients. So strong biomarkers, cell-based biomarkers, exosomes. Uh, I don't think I need to go through these take home messages. I think the message was fairly clear that we need to use more cell-based, more novel techniques where we can have an individualized cell-based assays towards individualized medicine. Not everybody is not the same. And uh, thank you. It's a long journey, as you can imagine. And these are my funding group and funding agency. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for 
enlightening us with this new era of role of exosomes and various other biomarkers in the field of diabetes not only diabetes but also you have shown us that how can we use that to identify the damage being done by this newer infectious agents also to our human body so with that now the session is open for questions so i will request my co chair if there are any questions dr raka any questions from your side yeah yeah so uh it's all no wise things i don't know whether what to ask but uh, <laughs> for the sake for the sake of community that we are here to te teach and uh, decipher the the knowledge to everybody what is the simplest way to use these kind of technology to a normal layman of india because see see when you talk to when you come to your clinics when you are seeing patient in front of you then what 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 you are going to offer because they are just begging towards say miracle for type 1 they are begging for what when they come crying for their kids uh, it's 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 very difficult for us to uh, see a ray of hope to them so i'll try to say that as a component a complex component from all of the u3 which we which we are carrying our indian genes and in in this expert panel try to accommodate a single statement how to go ahead and what to see in future right uh, let me take a stab at it so i think uh, i tried to show you the various samples from blood and fat biopsies uh i personally have done as far as indian genes are concerned of of course there's not many indian patients that we look at on a daily basis right so i essentially did and didn't do exercise for 6 weeks and i did my own colony count and it was dramatically different it actually shows that how quick the exercise washes out the effect and how quickly you can see the effects back as far as colony count so simple things like that if we can portray to our patients that you know your cells are responding it's your cells nobody else's cells that's a fairly simple thing to do and that's i think very telling and that that convinced me that i need to do some exercise every day uh i don't so, this is very anecdotal but it's out there anything yeah. anything related yeah. to gut microbiota anything related to gut microbiota from your sciences point of view which right. we can, so which we, we can give them a, a simple a linguistic way to uh, to enhance their immunity or whatever you can say i'll let, let somebody else take a stab and then i'll say something yeah um regarding the first question uh, there is a bigger picture for myself going from a obscure medical college in miraj where i carried the benedict reagent in my pocket to do the urine sugar <laughs> and all the way to the nih all i can say is there is a <clears throat> 25 to 40 years of difference between the cutting edge and delivery to the patients so the topics that we have chosen are at so much cutting edge that we are not delivering them to the clinics in the united states also Medicine. so yes okay. and are getting benefits of continuous glucose monitoring today which was unheard of in 1980s when i was in the med school there is and much faster growth and shrinking of the time between the bench to bedside and there is a india is progressing like amazing fast there is limited to very few people are still it's available and can be eventually obtained by others so yes there is a ray of hope but unfortunately today i cannot give second is uh, you talked about this um, gut microbiome dr sen is also obesity uh, board certified i have done obesity in world of weight loss the gut microbiome have been shown to be critical uh, there are not so much studies on the diabetes as far as i know anybody else knows so uh so as far as the uh, metabolic dysfunction and microbiota in uh, pre diabetes and diabetes i think what we have figured out is that so called firmicutes in your flora 
is more aligned to weight gain. And whereas bacteroides, mic microbiota or bacterial flora is associated with weight loss or so-called ketosis state uh, that we already know. What we, are, what we don't know is who responds to a ketogenic diet and why. And as you know, the first uh, line of therapy that we all are trained to do for prediabetes and obesity is lifestyle changes for how long and what we never tell the patients. But let's say ketogenic diet. And after the patient has done ketogenic diet, as you know, not everybody responds. At least one out of four will not respond. So what determines the non-change of flora? We know what changes happens, but clearly there's a subset of population which doesn't change. Mm -hmm. And that's where the data analysis and so-called predict mod uh, platform and other platforms that has been developed in, in data management is coming up. So we recently got a grant looking at floral changes in response to ketogenic diet in veterans and to develop a predict mod so that when a physician sees a flora data, they input it and tell you that you're going to respond and you're not. It's coming in. <laughs> I'm going to talk more about, about the data predict mod system in uh, the Diabetes India talk. So I'm going to leave it for that. And regarding the first question, I just want to uh, tell it in one sentence that probably a combination of the stem cell therapy and the immunotherapy in type 1 diabetes probably is a hope for type 1 diabetic patients. And I think we are quite close by this Y-site group and therapeutics. So the stem cells are really a good hope to enhance the beta cell mass. And uh, with the help of gene editing and the silencing of the HLA genes and other uh, immunotherapies, like, and that's the problem with immunotherapies, especially in India, what we see is that these monoclonal antibodies, they activate the FC portion of the uh, of the immunoglobulin. And this FC, they have the immunoglobulin FC portion. And this FC portion is the one which is responsible for activating the whole immune system. So now with the uh, genetic engineering of the FC portion of the immunoglobulin, like in our lab, what we are doing is we are using only the specific VH and the VL, the, the very specific antibody part, which is responsible for blocking the receptors. So it specifically it blocks the uh, target and the uh, like if the target is 10 to 15 amino acids, so this antibody is going to bind to that specific target. So if we can combine these two things, stem cells and the immune immunotherapies, which are engineered in such a way that they do not have the FC portion or the FC uh, portion is not functioning. So that can probably help uh, in uh, preserving the beta cell mass in both the prevention of diabetes as well as in the uh, cure of the patients who have already uh, developed type 1 diabetes and they are receiving the stem cells uh, pilot cell transplant. So that is what I feel. So one so, uh, question to all of you. Uh, okay, so your views please, about please. why type 1 diabetes is increased globally. What are the reasons you feel? Uh, uh, I I think it is uh, related to uh, like this, uh, uh, the the various environmental triggers. So uh, these environmental triggers in the form of like the uh, neonatal nutrition and various toxins. So probably this is causing a lot of genetic mutations in the form of this single nucleotide polymorphisms. And we are yet to, dis I mean, understand more uh, uh, this uh, SNPs or the single nucleotide polymorphism genes. And probably that is one of the reasons that there are changes which is happening at the level of the uh, genetic level. So that is like globally, uh, the type 1 diabetes is increasing. Uh, we need to go to... If I can uh, add a comment, yes, uh, yes, we, yes. we all must compliment uh, all the speakers. Yes, because, yes. you know, it was such a tough task to get speakers for this particular session. Um, you know, uh, we tried contacting so many people. Uh, even if you go to the brochure of the different uh, technology society meetings, there these topics are not covered. Uh, you know, I would have mailed at least 50 people who have published papers on gene therapy, stem cell therapy, but uh, even they didn't reply. And most of people are ready to talk on insulin pump, CGM, and those things. But for talking on gene therapy, stem cell therapy, exosomes, 
we definitely need uh, you know the speakers deserve a big round of applause so thank you very much for covering this session important sessions thank yes, you sir. for having us thank you so much yeah thank you so much also yes, thank you everyone we learn a lot we learn a lot about the basics of this things i think which is missing in routine events and cmes that we keep on learning same thing again and again but this is something new we have learned about this upcoming technology in the field of diabetes not only immunotherapy stem cells but also their role in the diagnosis and understanding the impact of interventions also so thank you very there much is, all of you there is a ray of hope you, you, yeah for sparing yeah, your valuable time hope. thank you and i would like to just uh, make yes, a comment here and uh, we are very thankful to dr sain dr nidhi gar dr raj uh, rajaram karne because you have joined us from the us and it is i think it is very early morning there and yes. so you took all the pain and to for this particular session as rakesh has already pointed out and next year we are going to have another uh, edition of uh, dtechcon and this is going to be one of the face to face meeting also and we would request your continuous support to the dtechcon and in the coming years as well thank you thank you very much and thanks thank thanks you. The, thank you thanks so much thank the you the mind of Namaste. dtechcon dr rakesh parikh and dr amit sir you you people have done uh, done a great great thing uh, collaborating all these big speakers and we have new key uh, keynote lectures already on uh, hall 1 uh, i'll request uh, our audience to go there also to see and i request all of my uh, uh, one thought was coming to my mind today when uh, we were having inaugural function dr shashank joshi as you all know him he coined a new term for digitonians so all the members are very excited all the faculty members organizing committee members and uh, you will see a lot of post talking about digitonians so he tell he told us that anybody who is working in the field of technology is a digitonian just like a rotarian right itself a rotarian or a lawyer so we are all digitonians thank you for being a digitonian until, until unless orthopedicians get some some differences on that opinion of work and digital <laughs> yeah shashank shashank and i were together in kgm uh, in 93 95 and i'm hoping to see him tomorrow i believe he's coming in yes he is talking tomorrow you are uh, most welcome sir if you have some time please join us again uh, tomorrow and we would be more than happy to have your comments on the session and your active participation thank you thank you sir thank, thank you sir thank you so much thank you